seated. The thought of grace is a marvelous thought. Did you catch that in the third line of this hymn? His very word of grace is strong as that which built the skies. The voice that rolls the stars along speaks all the promises. Contemplate that. The same voice by which he spoke things into existence is the voice that speaks the promises of grace to you and to me. Magnificent thoughts. Isaac Watts knew what he was writing. Take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, back there to that passage in the book of Exodus where we were just a few moments ago, Exodus chapter 3. We're looking at the names of God. Magnificent names of God. Did you notice in Psalm 138 that we read this morning what it said? That he has exalted his word above all his name. How valuable then is the word of God to us? If God has exalted his word above all his name, and we have been looking at the magnificent names of God, how valuable to us then is his word and how powerful his mighty word. Scripture is tied together, and we see beautiful and exquisite things as we delve into its depths. We've been looking at Psalm 23. Of course, it's been interspersed with a few things. We had Memorial Day when I preached on Remember What You've Been Taught in Titus chapter 1, verse 9, and then I was on the adoption trip out of the country for three weeks of guest speakers, and then we had our summer youth rally last week with Reverend Chris Sidwell, but prior to that, we were looking at the fifth compound name of Jehovah in the Old Testament, Jehovah Ra'ah, the Lord is my shepherd, Psalm 23. And we've already learned that there are 17 things in that psalm about the character of our shepherd. We'll not review all of those, but at least 17 things were told about the character of the one who calls himself our shepherd. We learned that the shepherd uses a rod sometimes, a stick for punishment and discipline, but it's also a stick for protection. We saw that God used that term when speaking to David about the Davidic covenant that would be passed on to Solomon, and God sometimes uses men as his rod of chastening. We found that Jesus speaks of that principle of God using a rod on us when we fail to be his witnesses. We saw that the rod is designed to emphatically teach the lessons of wisdom. And so if we are being foolish, God will use his rod to teach us wisdom. We saw the rod is what a good father uses to discipline his children. And there are multiple passages throughout scripture that deal with that issue. We saw the rod also speaks of leadership authority in the church, in the hands of the under shepherds and the pastors who exercise the authority of the chief shepherd. But then, last time you recall that we saw that there are at least seven ways that the rod of discipline is also a source of comfort. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Not only the discipline, which none of us seem to like, but it's also a source of comfort because, first, it proves the shepherd loves us. Second, it proves that we are his children. If you be without chastisement where all of our partakers, then are you bastards and not sons, the scripture tells us. The rod teaches us reverence for God. It proves that God is serious about our best good. He does it for our profit. It proves that God is transforming us into his holiness. The rod produces peaceable fruit of righteousness, and it is a source of spiritual exercise to make us strong in our faith. Yes, the rod is also a source of comfort. When used against the enemy, it's deadly and destroying, but when used on God's children, it's a source of discipline and a source of comfort. We gave you an illustration, you recall, of sheep in the wilderness and a shepherd watching over them. 
and the sheep being surrounded by wild animals, but the shepherd protecting them, and how the animals are always seeking to catch the little lambs that are straying too far from the flock. And we gave a special warning to the children, because God has given you an intermediate authority in the form of your parents, and how important it is for you to follow their godly teaching, their godly discipline, their godly example, not to stray too far because there are the wild animals there who are ready to nab you. The eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out, the young eagles shall eat it. We saw that faithful under-shepherds warn their flock of what will happen when God calls them to other service. We were reminded how God, our shepherd, the Lord, feeds us and takes care of us through his word. And that brings us to our text for today. Beginning at the start of verse 5 of Psalm 23, Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We've seen that first phrase, preparing a table before us in the presence of our enemies. That's the shepherd feeding his flock in the pasture, surrounded by the wild animals and the sheep stealers. But now the next phrase, thou anointest my head with oil. Our shepherd showers us with blessings and with honors that we don't deserve. Thou anointest my head with oil. A brief overview of the way oil was used in the Bible tells us many things about what the shepherd does for us. The first thing is that oil is used in the healing of wounds. We as sheep, as we go through life, receive damage. I think you've all probably at some point received some damage in walking through this life. There are things in the physical realm that are damaging to us. There are things that are related to disease. There are things that are related to physical incapacity. But there are things that are related to emotional trauma and stress things that other people perhaps have done to us that have hurt us economically, things that other people have done to us that have hurt us and our families, things that we can think back on that we'd rather not think back on, where we've received damage because the enemy of our souls has managed to penetrate the armor of defense and things have come into our lives related to sin. There's been damage. The first thing we discover that a shepherd uses the oil for is in healing the wounds of the wounded sheep. We see an illustration of that in the story of the Good Samaritan. A man has gone from Jerusalem to Jericho. Thieves have set upon him. They've beaten him severely. They've robbed him of everything that he has. They've wounded him. They've left him for dead. A priest comes by, passes him by. A Levite comes by, passes him by. And finally, a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And Jesus makes the point in the parable when the man who has questioned who is my neighbor asks him, he says, what do you think was neighbor to him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. Not only does the good shepherd pour the oil into the wounds to take care of his sheep, but those who belong to the shepherd recognize that they likewise have a ministry of giving the balm of the soothing oil to those who have been hurt. In your life, you're going to come across people who have desperate needs. 
who needs someone to be not like the priest, to be someone not like the Levite, but to be someone like the Samaritan. There was a great bitterness and difference between Jews and Samaritans. It wasn't merely a fellow Jew who did this for him, but one who was a Samaritan. You may be called upon at some point in your life to minister in the name of the shepherd to someone who is quite different than you are, someone that perhaps is on the fringes, far outside of your normal comfort zone. Remember the oil of the shepherd. The second way in which we see oil in scripture used is oil is used for anointing to positions of power, honor, and recognition. There are many, many, many illustrations in scripture. And as I give these illustrations, think about Jesus who honors us as his body. Jesus who honors us as his bride. Jesus who has made those who have trusted in him and the scripture says this multiple times in the New Testament, both kings and priests unto our God. You see, kings and priests were anointed in the Old Testament. It was a position of honor, a position of authority, a position of power for which they were anointed. We are called the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, kings and priests unto our God. We see an anointing taking place at the first king of Israel, Saul, in 1 Samuel chapter 10. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, Is not it because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? In chapter 15, Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. You see, the symbolic act that Samuel had performed was actually speaking of something that God himself had done. The anointing speaks of exaltation to positions of power, honor, and of recognition. David, of course, replaced Saul, but the same procedure took place in chapter 16. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. Very important phrase. We find it referred to in the book of Hebrews. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. When the Lord anoints you, and we will see that indeed our shepherd has anointed our head with oil. When the Lord anoints you, he empowers you to do what he has anointed you to do. What position he has placed you in. What he has gifted you to do. Thou anointest my head with oil. The Lord our shepherd anoints our head with oil. And it says from that day forward, the spirit of the Lord came upon David. And so when God anoints you for his service, his spirit will empower you for his service. It's a dangerous thing to stretch out your hand against the Lord's anointed, speaking not merely of King David, but, oh, what account the people of this world will give for raising up their hand against the Lord's anointed ones as they give account for the persecutions, even to the death, things that are going on today. I hope you can come tonight. Did you know there's a country in this world that has half the population of the United States jammed into a piece of territory the size of Nebraska. And the majority of that country is at sea level and floods continuously. 90% of that country is Muslim. Almost all the rest of the 10% of that country are Hindu. And there is a tiny fragment of believers who are there, who are holding out against the attacks of the enemy, even to death. I can't give you the name of the country, 
for security reasons. On this DVD, they have asked us not to give any specifics that would go out over the Internet or on Facebook or any other social media. But tonight you will meet some of the believers who are there. And people who are ministering in that country from this country in unique ways and reaching areas untouched by the gospel of Christ. You've got to come tonight. Oh, dear people, these are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And there are those who are reaching out and touching these who are the Lord's anointed ones. Someday they will give an account. Listen to what David said, and he understood the principle. 1 Samuel 24, 6 and verse 9 also, he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed. Now he's talking about Saul, wretched Saul, to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. In verse 9, David said unto Abishai, Destroy him not, for who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? In each generation, God had the king anointed. In each generation, God had the priests anointed. God has made us kings and priests unto our God. God has anointed us, as we'll see in a few moments, specific references in scripture. Who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and remain guiltless? 1 Kings 139, Zadok took, the priest took a horn of oil out of the tabernacle and anointed Solomon, and they blew the trumpet, and all the people said, God save King Solomon. Generation to generation to generation to generation. Thou hast anointed my head with oil. My cup runneth over. But there can be an abuse of the anointing that God gives. We see that anointing was also used to describe Satan's exalted position before his fall. Ezekiel 28 verse 14 Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. We don't have time today to study Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah chapter 14, but those tell us of the state of Satan prior to his fall. They describe the glory and the blessing that God had given to him, and then his abuse of it. Dear ones, we must not abuse the anointing that God has given to us. We find there are those who have failed to honor, in particular, the one to whom honor is due. Jesus, going to eat at the house of the Pharisee, when he is criticized for allowing a woman to anoint his feet, with ointment, points out that his host failed to anoint him. Luke 7, 46, My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Now let's bring it down to where it applies to us. Oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit throughout Scripture. We have multiple illustrations. I'll give you one, Acts 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. The anointed one, most perfectly anointed by the Holy Spirit, is the Messiah. And that, by the way, is what the word Messiah means. Mashiach means the anointed one. That's what the word Christ or Christos in Greek means. The anointed one. The one most perfectly anointed by the Holy Spirit is the Messiah. He is the one who does not have the Spirit by measure. That is, not a limited amount of anointing. John tells us this in John chapter 3, verse 34. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. The Holy Spirit is symbolized by the anointing oil. 
we find prophetic references to the Messiah as the anointed one of God. Multiple prophetic references in the Old Testament. For example, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 10. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of the heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king, exalt the horn of his anointed. Psalm 2. I love Psalm 2. One of the most important messianic psalms in the entire Old Testament. Psalm 2, Psalm 110, Psalm 16, Psalm 22. Magnificent psalms that tell us both about the first and second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But in Psalm 2, why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. That's Mashiach, Messiah in Hebrew. The kings of the earth are taking counsel against Jehovah and against his Messiah, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast their cords away from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak to them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. That's the Messiah who is going to come back to earth and reign in Jerusalem. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, quoted in the book of Hebrews as speaking of Christ. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. That is not a missionary verse, because it explains it in verse 9. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. That's what, when the Messiah asks for the nations of the earth, he's going to do with them. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And we spoke of those verses when we spoke of the rod of Messiah against his enemies. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Verse 12. What a beautiful picture of Christ. Here it is. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled, but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Prophetic references to the Messiah as the anointed one of God. Psalm 45, 7, Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. That verse, verse 7 of Psalm 45, is quoted in the New Testament to prove the deity of Christ as the Messiah. Hebrews 1, 8, But under the sun, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. That's the quotation of Psalm 45, 7. And it speaks of Christ, the Messiah. The one who is not like the angels, they are but ministering spirits, we're told in the preceding verses. But under the sun, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity, therefore God, and here's the quote, even thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Our Lord Jesus Christ speaks of this anointing and how God has anointed him in fulfillment of a prophecy in Isaiah 61, verse 1. Here's the prophecy. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord, that's Jehovah, hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prisons to them that are bound. Jesus quotes that verse in the New Testament to prove that he is the Messiah, the anointed one of God. Luke chapter 4, verse 17. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Here's the quotation. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. Now listen to verse 21. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture 
fulfilled in your ears. He was the anointed one of God. He is the one who is the Messiah. The third way we see oil being used in scripture is it's a symbol of being appointed to a position of divine service, consecration, and sanctification. Being appointed to a position of divine service, consecration, and sanctification. Sanctification means to be set apart, to be used exclusively by God and for his purposes. We see that illustrated for us in the Old Testament in the books of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. God giving directions to Moses says, And the holy garments of Aaron shall be his sons after him to be anointed therein and to be consecrated in them. The things that we wear are consecrated to God. How many Christians don't understand the principle of dressing in a way that glorifies God instead of attracting the lusts of the flesh? We're made priests unto our God. The holy garments of Aaron shall be his sons after him. There is a continuance from generation to generation in that which is modest, in that which brings glory to God, to be appointed, anointed therein and to be consecrated in them. Leviticus chapter 6, verse 20. This is the offering of Aaron and of his sons, which they shall offer unto the Lord in the day when he is anointed. The tenth part of an ephah of fine flour for a meat offering perpetual, half of it in the morning, half of it thereof at night. Chapter 4, verse 5. And the priest that is anointed shall take of the bullock's blood. He could not do this unless he was an anointed priest. And bring it to the tabernacle of the congregation. We find Leviticus chapter 8 explaining how the anointing is to take place. It's just like we have described in Psalm 23. And he poured the anointing oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him. Thou anointest my head with oil. Dear people, if you've personalized that psalm, I hope you begin to understand that you have been set apart in a very, very, very special way by God for his holy service. And he poured of the anointing oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him. Numbers chapter 7, verse 1. It came to pass on that day that Moses had fully set up the tabernacle and had anointed it and sanctified it and all the instruments thereof, both the altar and all the vessels thereof, and had anointed them and sanctified them. All of that had to take place before the very next thing could happen, which was the princes of the congregation were going to come and offer their offerings. But if the tabernacle and all the instruments of the tabernacle had not been anointed and sanctified and set apart for the use of God, it would have been merely a pagan ritual. Verse 10, it tells us the princes offered for dedicating of the altar in the day that it was anointed. Even the princes offered their offering before the altar. Oh, people, what we see pictured in the Old Testament unveils and unfolds and reveals for us Jesus Christ and our relationships with him. I know some of you were able to be here when we studied the tabernacle and all the different articles of furniture in the tabernacle and how the New Testament tells us specifically about each one of those articles, how it points to Jesus Christ and what it means and how it applies to the way in which we should be living for him. I'm sorry for those of you who missed that. We find in Acts chapter 4 verse 27, after the initial persecution of the church and the beating of Peter and John, the church is gathered together praising God 
And they say, For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. You'll find that the world gathers against those whom God has anointed. Christ is our chief and prime example of that. But those who have received the anointing of the Spirit of God, and you have if you're a Christian, you will find that the world, the flesh, and the devil will oppose you. If they gather together against Christ, whom thou hast anointed, they will certainly gather together against us. Yes, we have been anointed. 2 Corinthians one twenty one. Now he which establishes us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. You've not been through an oil anointing ceremony, but you have been anointed. Baptism is not the same thing as anointing. He who has anointed us is God. Do you understand your high calling as those who have been anointed by God? You see, it's a position that bears serious responsibility because you now represent Christ to the world around you. You are fulfilling a service to God as kings and priests. Just as the kings in the Old Testament were anointed and they had a position of responsibility and of leadership to set examples for others as the priests were anointed before they could go about their ministry in service to God. The one who has anointed us is God. You have been anointed by the Spirit of God. You represent Christ to the world around you as you fulfill your appointed service to God. Old Testament symbolism in the Old Testament tabernacle, we find it all over the place. We find it in relation to the offerings. For example, Exodus 29, 2, the unleavened bread and cakes unleavened tempered with oil and wafers unleavened anointed with oil. Of wheat and flour shalt thou make them. We find the meal offerings anointed with oil. We find the anointing oil, anointing the tabernacle and all that's therein and sanctifying it. You see, we're sanctified, we're set apart, and we are anointed, very interesting, by many things in the New Testament. By the truth, by the word, by faith, by the blood of Christ, by the Holy Spirit, by God the Father. We are sanctified. In Christ Jesus, all three members of the Trinity are involved in this, in this sanctification, which is symbolized by the anointing. Our heavenly rewards and inheritance are based on our sanctification, our setting apart by that anointing that God has done. So it's very significant that we understand that doctrine of sanctification, symbolized by the anointing of oil, Actualized by the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God who has placed us into the body of Christ. It's essential that we understand that we know and apply in practice what sanctification is all about, not merely in our position. John seventeen nineteen, And for their sakes I sanctify myself. Jesus speaking, the high priestly prayer of John 17, that they also might be sanctified through the truth, sanctification through the truth. Hebrews 2.11, for both he that sanctifieth, that is our Lord Jesus Christ, and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Brings you back to those Old Testament passages, Psalm 45, verse 7, Jesus in the midst of his brethren, calling us brethren because we have been sanctified, we have been set apart, the oil of the Spirit of God has been poured upon us. He anointeth my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Acts 26. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sin and an inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith. Sanctified through the truth. 
sanctified by God the Father, sanctified in Christ. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, Acts 20, 32, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified, sanctified by the word of his grace. Romans 15, 16, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable. Remember all those things about the offerings in the Old Testament? Paul is drawing our attention back to those offerings where we have the anointing of oil to set things apart unto God. And he talks about the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable being sanctified, set apart by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is symbolized by that oil of anointing. It's a sacrifice. He's offering up the Gentiles as a sacrifice to God. You know Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The oil of anointing, speaking of how we are set apart, we are sanctified. That's what sanctified means. It means to be set apart. It doesn't mean holier than thou. It means to be set apart for God's service alone. You have received, if you are a believer, the anointing of the Spirit of God, which means you have been set apart for his holy service not for the works of the flesh, not for the works of the devil, not for the works of the world, but for the holy service of God. 1 Corinthians 1, 2, Under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Brothers and sisters, if you've trusted Christ, you are a saint. Now, we use in the common vernacular the word saint as somebody who's living a goody-goody two-shoes life. That's not how the Bible uses it. Those who have been saved by the grace of God, placed in Christ Jesus, have been positionally set apart. They are, in fact, set-apart ones. They are saints. But our position is often belied by our practice. And the exhortations of the New Testament are, if you have been anointed by the Spirit of God, demonstrate in the way in which you live the reality of your position in Christ. Hebrews 10.10 10, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Why did he die for our sins? Was it just to give us a fire escape from hell? No. It was that he might bring many sons to glory and that we might be sanctified, that we might be set apart for God's service, that we might be purified and cleansed, that our lives might be a holy representation of Jesus in this world. Ye are my witnesses. Not I hope you will be my witnesses. Ye are my witnesses. Jesus said. For good or for bad, we're it. What kind of a witness are we being in this world? By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. But it's also a warning in that same chapter in verse 29. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden under foot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit 
of grace. You see, there is an application of this portion of Psalm 23. Thou anointest my head with oil. Here's the application. Are you living like sanctified ones? In other words, are you living like those who have been anointed with the oil of the Holy Spirit? Those who have been set apart for design, divine service like the priests of the Old Testament. You claim to be saved. Here's the question that I always ask. What difference has it made in your life? What difference has it made in your life? The difference made by the anointing of the Holy Spirit is the visible proof to the watching world that you have been anointed with oil in the presence of your enemies. Your enemies are the world, the flesh, the demons, and the devil. You see, God's anointing is a declaration to the enemy that you mean business with God. But be warned, if you demonstrate that, the enemy will come after you, just like they came after David. Listen to this, 2 Samuel 5, 17. But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David, and David heard of it and went down to the hold. You say, well, then I, I don't want to really show it. You know, we're commanded to visibly show that we are the vessels that have been anointed. We're commanded to show that we are the vessels that have been cleansed for use by Christ. Second Timothy 2.21 If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, sanctified, that's set apart, Sanctified, that means you've been anointed with the oil of the Spirit of God. And meat for the Master's use. Not merely a vessel that's set on the shelf because it's a dirty vessel, because it's a cracked vessel, because it's a useless vessel. Sanctified and meat for the Master's use and prepared unto every good work, the visible manifestation that you have been anointed by the Spirit of God. Hebrews 10.14, For by one offering, this is why Christ died for you, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word and for its power. Thou anointest my head with oil. A simple phrase. But as we begin to track that through scripture, we discover the richness and the depth and how it applies to us as you have anointed us with the Spirit of God. You have set us apart for your holy service. You have given us a position of honor and blessing. You expect us to manifest it clearly because your anointing also empowers us. Even as David, when he was anointed, went forth in the power of the Spirit of the Lord. Father, please cause us to understand not merely our positional sanctification, but how you expect us to practice it so that others might know as well. We commit this your word as it has been proclaimed today into your care and keeping in the hearts of each one of us here present. You know how it should apply to each one of us. And we pray that you will so do that Jesus Christ might be glorified. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 621. Tell me the old, old story. Six